Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to, the, to today's one, webinar. This is Sabrina DiMartini from the Community Technical Assistance Center and Managed Care Technical Assistance Center of New York State. This is the second to last webinar in our series called Shattering Walls, Sex Abuse and Agency. This series was created by our tech clinical team and community collaborative board here at CTAC to build more awareness around sexual abuse and violence and provide perspective and information about resources and best practices for providers who work with clients who may have experienced or are experiencing sexual abuse, violence, or assault. In this series, we have had webinars on general awareness and overview, a survivor's experience, and the male perspective. This webinar will focus on community-based interventions, and we will conclude with a webinar on best practices on June 8th. Our session today will be an introductory historical examination of the intimate partner violence movement and its eventual reliance on carceral practices and policies. It will then discuss contemporary community-based interventions, commonly labeled transformative justice interventions, which build on community relationships and strengths instead of a dependence on incarceration and police interventions. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to orient everyone to the WebEx system so you know how to participate in today's event. Please note that upon joining the webinar, you have been placed on mute to avoid any background noises that may distract others from listening to the presentation today. If you come across any technical issues during today's event, please chat to the host, Brianna, who will be able to assist you. You will have the opportunity to submit questions for the Q&A portion of today's presentation by utilizing the chat box feature, which is located on the right-hand side of your screen. If it is not visible, click the dialog bubble on the top right toolbar and it should appear. In order to ensure that we are able to answer as many questions as time permits, we are requesting that you send in your questions at any point during the webinar, and we will address them during the Q&A portion of today's session. We are very excited to have Mimi Kim with us today. Mimi Kim is a longtime advocate and, advo and activist working on issues of domestic violence and sexual assault, especially in immigrant communities of color. She's a co-founder of Insight, Women and Trans People of Color Against Violence, the founder of Creative Interventions, and an assistant professor of social work at California State University, Long Beach. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Um, and welcome everybody to the webinar. Um, I am really happy to join you today, and I just have to say that I also received my MSW from NYU, so particularly happy to be part of this community with you all. Um, I believe that most of you are practitioners um, uh, in uh, related fields related to violence, um, but I know that we have people from all over today. I, as Sabrina said, I'm also a longtime advocate in the field of domestic violence and sexual violence and have based my practice and research on my experience in the field and my passion for interventions that are aligned with the values of social justice. So today we're going to be talking about community-based interventions or what I call everyday people transforming violence and you'll know a little bit more about what I mean by that as we go through this webinar. Uh, we'll have time for Q&A at the end, so I'll just run through this. Um, uh, uh, the, the talk today um, is in three parts. So I'm going to start out with a pop political context that I believe makes community-based interventions particularly important. Um, I'll be talking about, um, I just want to introduce the term carceral because that will come up somewhere in the talk and it's something that I think people understand once I explain, but not necessarily a term people are familiar with, so carceral, meaning that part of the government or the state having to do with um, prisons and jails, um, police, arrest, incarceration. Um, so that will become important as I go through my, the beginning part of my talk. Um, I'm going to follow this with some discussion of community-based interventions to violence and an introduction to the organization I founded called Creative Interventions. Um, I'm also, in between that, going to share a little bit more about my historical research um, that I think is very pertinent to um, the reasons in which um, I went ahead with many other people in this country to start looking at exploring and uh, creating new kinds of community-based responses to violence. 
So um, in starting with um, the, the political context that makes this relevant, uh, some of you may be very familiar with this chart, but my guess is that for some of you this might be the first time you've seen it. And this is a chart um, of U.S. rates of incarceration. You can see from the chart that in 1973 or around there, um, there was what some people call now the punitive turn. If you look at this chart and you go back, it starts in 1945, but if you go all the way back to 1920 when this first chart first was started, we have relatively flat rates of incarceration in the United States. But I think you'll see that that is no longer the case starting in 1973 when there's a very, very rapid rise in rates of incarceration of 500% between 1973 and 2009. Um, I think that is a pretty astounding figure. Um, what I think a lot of us are now aware of is that our rates of incarceration are extremely high and, um, and uh, reflecting deep racial disparities. Uh, right now in the United States, um, we can expect that for a black uh, boy or a black man that there is a one out of three uh, chance that they will be involved in the criminal justice system at some point in their life. Uh, we see that black men are six times more likely than white men to be incarcerated in jails or prisons. Um, and for young men at the age of 18, that rate is 10 times. We also see that the women's rate of incarceration for women has been rapidly increasing, while still the numbers of women incarcerated is still lower than that for men. The rate of uh, rise in incarceration ha is now higher than that for men. We see racial disparities with women who are um, in prison with uh, black women two times more likely to be incarcerated than white women. Um, of course, there are many, many more statistics that um, can go with this slide, but I'm going to move on. I just want to have, uh, um, uh, remind us, if we need reminding at all, that um, the, the rates of incarceration in the United States are very uh, shocking and high for all populations in the United States, but in particular for communities of color, um, and that includes queer communities, um, uh, gender nonconforming people, this has been very high. Um, just to add a little bit of emphasis to this, uh, I think if we see the rates of incarceration in the United States and compare them to other, and this is a, a graph of other OECD countries, it's way off the charts. And in fact, if we added Russia to this, it would be close to the United States, but not, uh, but the uh, United States would still be higher. In it. If we even brought a country like North Korea into this, we would have rates of incarceration that are relatively similar. So we're going back to um, the rates of incarceration and uh, the talk for today. Um, as I was doing some of my research to look in, into the history of what I consider my own movement, I was really surprised to see this, and that is the coincidence and timing of the punitive turn and the start of the anti-domestic violence movement, 1973. Uh, if we look at the anti-rape movement, I think that's usually uh, set to start around 1971. So this isn't to say that we, we, we caused, of course, this rates of incarceration, but I think it is to say that there is some kind of relationship between the development of our movement and the way that we've addressed violence and also the development of what some people call um, our uh, state of mass incarceration. So I want to spend the next uh, few slides uh, just uh, briefly entering some of the historical research I did. Again, I have a long time experience as um, an advocate and an activist, but I really wanted to go back and see how is it that we got to this place? And I wanted to turn back to the early parts of the movement um, to see if we could get some answers. Here I saw two paradoxes, which some of you might agree with, in particular if you're, um, if you're familiar with the anti-violence movement. Um, one is, how is it that a social movement that's considered progressive, you know, started by feminists, it's emancipatory, cho chose to choose, uh, chose criminalization as a dominant strategy? 
So I think today we see that um, it seems pretty common sense. Of course, if you see violence, you're going to call 911. But that wasn't necessarily true if we look back at 1973. So uh, specific choices were made that this wasn't necessarily um, a common sense approach at that time. Uh, I think the second part of this paradox is this, that um, for some of you, may, you may be familiar that the feminist anti-violence movement, whether it's the anti-rape or um, battered women's movement, are really known to be particularly successful. And part of that success rests on our ability to, to change legislation. So we had a time in 1973 where very few states had legislation about domestic violence in particular and, um, and uh, criminalization. Uh, very few police departments actually even considered domestic violence or sexual violence to be a crime. So how is it that this movement was so successful in getting um, law enforcement to recognize gender-based violence as a crime? But if we look today at 2017, I think few advocates would consider themselves to be kind of on top of this game, but rather to feel um, dominated by the criminal justice system and what the criminal justice is telling us that we need to do as opposed to the other way around. So how did that happen? Um, what I looked at in thinking about this was uh, looking at these two spheres. And one is civil society, if you look on the left, and the state on the right, state being the government. And in particular, if we're looking at um, the anti-violence movement, the, the, uh, the carceral arm of the government, right, or the criminal justice system. We see on the left is civil society or the land of uh, the sphere of families, of um, nonprofit organizations where many of us practice today. And we also see in looking at social movements that we usually think of social movements as being in the realm of civil society, volunteer organizations, social action organizations, social movement organizations. And we look at the state as being uh, that sphere where those of us in social movements will make demands, demanding changes, demanding attention. So part of the story I looked at um, in my historical research was how is it that these two distinct spheres ended up over time looking more and more blended uh, to the point where sometimes we couldn't tell one from the other. Um, I and some others call this uh, process uh, hybridization. So that's like a beginning part of my story. Um, I'm going to skip most of the story. And in fact, if you're interested, I have another um, webinar I'm going to be doing later on um, in the summer that's going to be going more into the story um, and then also another webinar into the more contemporary story. But what I found in looking at Two, uh, I looked at two distinct institutions, that of um, the Victim Witness Program. And the vi Victim Witness Program, as many of you know, is one in which um, uh, many of us have uh, special units that are for victims in prosecutors' offices. So if we look at sexual violence, a special unit where victims can be better served, where they can get attention, where they might get access to resources and they might um, get more explanations of the, uh, the procedures that they can expect to participate in. Um, the other one I looked at was the community coordinated response. For those of you in domestic violence, you're probably pretty familiar with the CCR. For those of you in sexual assault, you might see this known as the SART or the sexual assault um, SART response. Uh, I'm not quite remembering right now what the T stands for, so I'm sorry. Um, so the SART, um, and this is another institution that was really started by a social movement, people, feminist social movements that were interested in saying, hey, why aren't you doing anything about this issue of sexual assault or domestic violence? What we found in the story was that we started with people making demands and saying, listen, you need to do something. You are not paying any attention to gender-based violence as a crime. In fact, you're blaming victims or you're stepping away. Um, 
And so this is a form of contestation started in, um, in the 1970s and early, early 1980s. What we moved to was what we might call collaboration. So in demanding that law enforcement actually start cooperating with us, um, that we uh, started these institutions that, uh, that made more concrete these forms and these relationships of collaboration. But we also found, um, if you see that little uh, uh, woman sign uh, on top of the woman in that relationship, that there were ways in which feminists actually exercised some form of subversive control. In fact, some of them said we were infiltrating the system or that we were creating new kinds of forms of institutions that would make sure that law enforcement really followed some feminist principles. So there were subversive and covert ways in which feminists kept, kept control over a relationship that might look, have looked more equal and more collaborative. What we found over time, particularly with replication, was that these forms of, uh, of feminist control tended to slip away. If you think about manuals that you have when, when things get replicated, they're manualized. Do you have in that manual, well, we're going to have subversive forms of feminist control? No, that's usually something that gets left out. So as things got replicated, and I see this in the next slide, we had more and more forms of these institutions that actually did not or lost feminist control, which often meant that there was strengthened control by law enforcement. What we saw over time then was the hybridization, as I talked about before, of the spheres of civil society or kind of an autonomous social movement with that of law enforcement. So in creating these institutions that blended or collaborated together between these two spheres, these, uh, these boundaries uh, dissolved over time and it became difficult to tell um, one from the other. Um, these new forms and institutions increasingly occupied different parts, different regions, different localities of what we might call this entire kind of social movement field or uh, entity to, uh, nationally. And what I would say is what happened over time is the social movement that was uh, winning demands at the beginning increasingly got subordinated to a law enforcement system or a criminal justice system that was once its target. If we wanted to call these steps, we might call this dance the carceral creep. So I'm going to move on to step back and think about how it is that what we want, and when we, I say we here, talking about all of us, but in particular looking at um, the women's movement or the feminist movement, saying that we, what we wanted, women's rights, we want justice, we want accountability, we want human rights and safety, and we want solutions to a myriad of social problems. How is it that what we want increasingly got swept into what many of us now know as the prison pipeline? So I, like many of us, have been seeking a resolution to what we see as the problem of mass incarceration and the ways in which some of us have done our work in such a way that we actually might contribute to that system um, and, uh, and even if we have problems with it, find, find that our hands are tied in trying to resist the system. So what is the resolution to that? Um, very, very uh, obviously this is quite a complex question, but uh, in more simple terms, I could say that for those of us working in domestic violence and sexual assault, many more of us have been talking about how we can dismantle what has become an over-reliance on criminalization as a response to violence or harm. We could say that a second part of this is building our community-based responses at all levels. So how is it not, not only dismantling our reliance on criminalization, but strengthening alternatives to that? 
From another viewpoint, I looked at this in thinking about my own work in domestic violence, and I think that we could also uh, have a similar viewpoint in looking at sexual assault. What is it that survivors want? Looking at domestic violence and the kind of options that we have for survivors, do we want escape from shelter? Uh, to shelter, excuse me. Do we do survivors want to arrest their abuser, the person that harmed them? Do we, they want to leave their relationship? Some do. But how many survivors have told us that they what they really want is to stay safe at home? What they really want is not necessarily to end the relationship, but to stop the violence. What they really want is not to leave, but to keep their homes and their communities intact. So if we look at the left side and the options that we have, and it's kind of showing that this is the, the homework we've been doing over the last 30, 40 years. And I wouldn't say necessarily that we have an A, but this is what we've been trying to sort of perfect. But when we ask the question, how is it that we might have the options on the right? I would say still in 2017, oh, I'm sorry. We have a kind of a question mark. Um, people are not sure. And when we, when, we want, when we ask the question, not only what do survivors want, but what are communities asking for? I think again, we're seeing that what people are asking for is, yes, some are saying we want effective uh, options that we find on the left, but we also want options that allow for some of these choices on the right. So again, this doesn't cover all choices and all options available, but I think it presents kind of um, some of the dilemmas that I know that we're facing in uh, our work on sexual assault and domestic violence. And for those of you who are doing work in other arenas, you might find this also familiar. So I want to say that these questions about what some of us might call building alternatives or building alternatives in communities is something that many of us are talking about right now. And I just have a partial list of some of the organizations, um, some, of, some of which are, are no longer in existence today but have been very actively working on this question and, and working towards finding solutions that are alternatives. Some of them are in the domestic violence or sexual assault sector, some of them are not. And um, as some of you may be familiar that uh, with some of the terms that uh, communities have started using to address these alternatives, one being a community accountability and the other that some of you may have started hearing is transformative justice. Now, I'm not going to spend time uh, getting uh, deeply into these different kinds of forms of alternatives, um, except in reflecting more about what we did at Creative Interventions. But again, these are uh, actually going to be coming up in another webinar, and these conversations have been happening a lot across the country, um, so I uh, urge you to join in. I'm going to move on to uh, highlight the work that we've done at Creator Interventions. And this is an organization that I helped to start in 2004. Um, I had been doing the work of um, domestic violence and sexual assault intervention for many years. I had actually worked at a shelter for 10 years. And I saw many of these things that I already presented. I, I, I saw how much we started relying on law enforcement and telling people to call 911 when working in an immigrant organization serving oppressed communities of color, I knew that wasn't a possibility for many, many of the survivors coming to our shelter, uh, much less those um, calling our crisis lines. And yet, this is something we kept repeating. Um, I also saw how survivors were asking for different kind of options, but that we had very little to say when they asked for them. We had very little to offer them. So um, I and a few other people decided to start an organization which would center our practice on these very types of options that we wished were around but that weren't at this point um, really available uh, in the United States or at least not widely available. So uh, this organization, Creative Interventions, we started with kind of a tagline that we got from uh, a talk that Beth Ritchie gave. 
that this is not about ending violence, but this is about liberation. What is it that we can do in our approaches if we not didn't just look at the kind of short outcome, short-term outcome of ending violence, but we had a broader horizon of looking towards the world that we would want to see, the kind of interventions and approaches we would want to see, the kind of communities we would want to see. The second tagline we had was make ending violence an everyday act. And I want to talk a little bit more about this because I think this is what might be um, unique about uh, our work. When we talked about community-based interventions, um, it was our, with our understanding that uh, that this is really where the expertise lay in terms of um, who is it that really understands the cultures that influence the conditions in which violence happens, but also the possibilities of way, the ways that change can happen. Who is it that really understands the histories, the values, the potentials, the harms and traumas that were suffered not only by individuals involved in violence, but by the communities in which they live? Um, how is it that we as practitioners in domestic violence and sexual assault that may have certain kinds of expertise based upon our experience, how can we join together with those who really do have an intimate knowledge, um, skills, and experiences in their own communities, whether they be a, a family or a broader community? How can we leverage our own expertise? How can we share that together? Um, with everyday people, uh, we also wanted. We also understood that uh, when we think about first responders to violence, the first responder is often not the police. It's often not even our crisis lines. But the first responders are often friends, family, and community members. What would it mean if we could form an approach? that could actually grow these numbers of go-to people or first responders in the community, but also equip them with the knowledge, skills, and community support that they would need to make interventions effective, safe, possible, and following some of the values that we have in terms of social justice. Ultimately, we wanted to move the site of intervention from not only from law enforcement, but even from our own offices, our own shelters, and move that site of intervention to the homes, streets, and communities, neighborhoods, where violence actually occurs. What, how could we do that, and what would that look like? So briefly, I want to start with the creative interventions model, the one that we started with in 2004 when we opened our doors, and really, we're doing what we saw was an experiment. We started with some basic principles of what we wanted our approach to look like. First of all, that would be based in community, um, using that, uh, those notions of community that I just shared with you. Second, that we would look towards a model that was collective and coordinated. Uh, what do we mean by that? That we would mean for people to be able to gather together to not only create an act of intervention, to, be, to actually be able to create a system of intervention where different people might take very different roles based upon who they were in the community, their time available, their skills, how important they were to the people that were involved in perhaps a situation of harm. How is it that we could ask people to turn to others and see who were their go-to people who could they bring together to actually form a response to violence and not only think about those of us who are in social services or in law enforcement? The second part of that is how can we make their responses collective, uh, excuse me, coordinated? So how is it, um, this was based upon hearing from people how mothers stepped in, sisters stepped in, uncles stepped in, but oftentimes they stepped in in different and sometimes uh, conflicting ways. A uh, mother might have something they might say to do. Sister might have something totally different. Uh, priest, minister, um, uh, monk might have something very different that they said. How is it uh, that we could actually bring together the people that um, someone might rely upon or a family might rely upon and have them actually coordinated so that they could uh, more smoothly form a system of response as opposed to kind of a more chaotic and uninformed collection of individual responses. 
The third part of this model was that we wanted it to be open-ended, that we did not want to assume that somebody wanted necessarily to, to choose from um, a menu of options. Uh, do you want to go to shelter? Do you want uh, an attorney? Do you want a restraining order? But rather, we would ask questions about what they did want, and we would let them answer. Um, this might include options that we never would have thought of, and that only makes sense in their lives. This might include options to stay in a relationship, which is not an option that I felt that, at least in the domestic violence program that I worked in and many that I know of, was not an option that we provided. We might have respected somebody's right to stay in a relationship, but we saw that as a, kind of a sign that somebody had a lack of preparedness to actually take the intervention that we thought was best, which was to leave that relationship. That's what we meant by open-ended. Um, we wanted this to be holistic. And now holistic, I know, can mean many, many things. And I'm going to have a slide uh, following this that goes into this a little bit more. But what this really meant for us that was that we, um, in our model, did not necessarily only uh, deal with a survivor of violence. We might actually work with uh, the social network of that of a survivor. We might deal with friends and family. They may be the ones that are first coming to us. So we would holistically be able to work with survivors, with community members, or even with the person who had done harm. We also held holistic to mean that even if we were only working with one uh, part of that whole system of harm and violence, uh, and also of help, that we would hold the well-being of others in kind of the spirit of our um, approach and that we would not um, necessarily consider um, kind of narrowly just looking at one or looking only, only at uh, punishment for, let's say, the person doing harm. That moves us to um, the next kind of principle or value that we held was that our approach may actually engage the person doing harm. Um, that this wouldn't be done, I think, in any way that was casual or without a lot of foresight and possibly a lot of preparation. But that is something that we would want to consider as something that could be part of this approach. Um, this kind of leads to our notion that we really sometimes need to take risks to achieve safety. And that might be kind of against the conditioning that we had in the, the growing conditioning, the anti-violence movement, which is that we didn't want to take any risks to endanger someone. Um, and I think that that kind of thinking led to our narrowing idea of what safety meant, that that meant immediate physical safety, so that if somebody went back into an abusive relationship, we would could only see that as being unsafe. We couldn't see ways in which we could reduce risk or we could uh, even see being in a relationship as perhaps less risky than losing one's whole community. For example, uh, we saw this to be true for many people that are in small immigrant communities, for example. How is it that we could actually see that some survivors didn't see immediate safety as their priority, but were willing to take certain risks in order to achieve broader goals or even to achieve safety in the long run. These, uh, so let's see this outer ring. I, I want to move to the center, which is that this is seen as a facilitated model, meaning that we did not see ourselves as the answer or offering an intervention or even doing an intervention, that we saw ourselves as facilitators that were there to answer questions or to answer questions if people have them, to, but mostly to ask questions that would help people to clarify what their situation of violence was, what their goals might be, who might step forward to help them, what were the risks of safety that they actually were facing, and how could they reduce those risks, who might have influence and leverage over somebody who is abusive or who is causing harm, how might they be brought into an intervention to actually directly support and perhaps confront 
a person doing harm to to um, to support them to make changes? Was, is that possible? Um, what we did uh, during our pilot program was we offered a, an office space that had a lot of chairs so that multiple people could come in um, if someone wanted. We had a white board where we were there to write down people's questions, people's ideas, um, and kind of externalize that so people could have a clearer picture of what was going on and what they wanted to do. We were there with stories that we had from another uh, part of our project called the Storytelling and Organizing Project, give them some ideas about what other people had done. So we, have, we were facilitators. We were not the interveners. We saw the intervention then that would actually happen being again in homes, in churches, in spaces and places where people actually live, work, worship, uh, play, gather with others. So getting a little bit more into this idea of holistic, um, for those of us who work in uh, violence intervention programs, many of us hold survivor-centeredness as um, uh, an important tenet in our work, and we did and we do as well, that is important to center and support survivors and to support their self-determination, their safety, their healing, um, to elevate their voice. Uh, if we look to the right, we also saw communities or collectives as really important actors in addressing harm, in supporting change, and in shifting um, social norms within communities. Uh, and in the center here, we also wanted to have an approach that may engage and support people who have done harm to actually take responsibility or take accountability and make that change without necessarily relying on arrest, on law enforcement, on police, to do that work or to consider that a form of justice. What is it that we can do within our own communities that might actually support that happening? I just want to move to one other slide that I think gives you a little bit more insight into some of the things that we learned by doing our pilot project and that um, we're sharing with the public, and that is this notion of accountability that's not necessarily an, uh, a, an outcome, but a process. So um, just briefly, I want to go through this, that we saw accountability or change, maybe starting with just simply reducing or stopping the immediate violence. That might not even might not even involve any change in attitude at all, but that could be an immediate first step. What can we do to actually support uh, people doing harm to recognize that they had actually even committed violence? Um, as we know, many people use denial and minimization, blaming the victim, to get out of um, understanding and recognizing their responsibility for violence. How can we move then towards people recognizing the consequences of violence without making excuses for that. And um, even if the, cons the consequences were unintended or perceived as unintended on their part. Could we move towards getting people to actually making re re make repairs for the harm that they had caused? Could we actually move towards getting them to really more deeply change their attitudes and behaviors so this kind of violence or harm would not be repeated in their lives or other people's lives. And finally, something maybe a little bit more, um, uh, more or less concrete, can I say that this is, um, how can we get people to actually then become really healthy and positive members of our communities? Those that we can trust, those can, that can be part of the solution to violence and not part of the problem. So with creative interventions, we had three strategies and three kind of sets of products. First of all, we piloted community-based interventions. We did this mostly from the period of about 2006 to 2009. Um, and we, from that experience, we created the interventions, Creative Interventions Toolkit, which has um, our lessons learned um, that spells out our model and gives people some tools and instruments that they can use 
um, if they are facing violence in their communities, in their families. Um, they also are things that organizations can think of adopting if they want to move towards um, expanding their approaches to community-based interventions. Second, we have a story collecting project where we knew that a lot of people had actually intervened in violence in, in their communities, and we wanted to collect everyday stories. Uh, we have a storytelling and organizing project, and I'm going to share a story with you um, to close this out. And we also wanted to transform our field or our sector or social movements to be able to provide these kinds of interventions more broadly and more widely. So I'm going to set, uh, end with a story of liberation that we have from when we collected stories from community members and everyday people about what they did in their own families to end violence. This is a story um, not of uh, sexual violence, but I think it's one that can, uh, has a lot of lessons to teach us about um, the power of uh, collective response. And I just have the story. I'm going to read it, but I have it here because I know for some of you, this will help you to retain the story and to kind of uh, reflect on it as we go along. So here's the story. We live in a town, but many of my husband's extended family, um, I'll just say, share that this is a story that's in New Zealand from a Maori community. Um, I'm going to use the English words. Uh, our extended family live in the valley where he grew up about 40 kilometers away. My husband and his brother are renowned for a number of things, one being how they extend the life of their cars and vans using highly technical items like string and wire, another how they share their vehicles for a variety of tasks such as moving furniture or transporting relatives, building materials, tractor parts, traditional herbal medicine, medicines, eels, vegetables, dogs and pigs, dead or alive. They are renowned for being people of the people, the ones to call on in times of trouble and death, the ones who will solve the problem and make a plan. They travel to and from town, to the coast to dive for seafood, to endless meetings, to visit extended family along the many kilometers of dirt roads in and around the valley, through flood or dust, depending on the season, in those patched up, beat up, prized cars. There are a number of things to know about the valley. What is that the last 33 children in the world of their small sub-tribe to grow up and be educated on their own lands go to school here, despite government efforts to close the school? Another is that the valley is known to outsiders and insiders as Patu Wahini, literally meaning to beat women. And this is not said as a joke. The mountain for this valley is named as the doorway spirits pass through on the way to their final departure from this life. This valley is also the valley where my husband and his siblings were beaten at school for speaking their first language. It is the valley their mother sent them to so they would be safe from their father, back to her people. It is where they milked cows, pulled a plow, fed pigs, but often went hungry and were stock whipped, beaten, and worse. My brother-in-law still, still lives in the valley in a group of houses next to the school. So it's no surprise that one of our cars would be parked by these houses, right by where the children play. Perhaps also not a surprise that while playing that time old international game of rock throwing, our eight year old nephew shouted the back window of the car. If I'd been listening, I probably would have heard the oh and ah of the other children that accompanied the sound of glass breaking from town. And if I'd been really tuned in, I would have heard the rapid frightened heartbeat of that boy as well. His mother is my mother's cousin, is my husband's cousin, and she was on the phone to us right away. She was anxious to assure us that that boy would get it when his father came home. His father is a big man with a pig hunter's hands who hoists his pigs onto a meat hook unaided. He is a man of movement and action, not a man for talking. Those hands would carry all the force of proving that he was a man who knew how to keep his children in their place. Beating that boy would be his way of telling us that he had also learned his own childhood lessons well. So before he got home, we burned up the phone lines, sister to sister, cousin to cousin, brother-in-law to sister-in-law, wife to husband, brother to brother, 
This was because my husband and his brother know that there are some lessons you are taught as a child that should not be passed on. The sound of calloused hand on tender flesh, the whimpers of watching sisters, the smell of your own fear, the taste of your own blood and sweat as you lie in the dust. Useless, useless, better not born. This is a curriculum like no other, a set of lessons destined to repeat unless you are granted the grace of insight and choose to embrace new learning. So when the father of that boy came home and heard the story of the window, that boy was protected by our combined love and good humor, by the presence of a senior uncle, by invitations to decide how to get the window fixed in the shortest time for the least money. Once again, phone calls were exchanged with an agreement being made on appropriate restitution. How a barrel of diesel turns into a car window is a story for another time. Next time my husband drove into the valley, it was to pick up the car, and that boy was an anxious witness to his arrival. My husband also has very big hands, hands that belong to a man who has spent most of his life outdoors. These were the hands that reached out to that boy to hug, not hurt. A lot of bad things still happen in the valley, but more and more they are being named and resisted. Many adults who learn their early lessons there will never return. For people of the land, this is profound loss. Our first identifiers on meeting are not our own names, but those of our mountains, rivers, subtribe, and tribe. To be totally separate from these is a dislocation of spirit for the already wounded. This is only a small story that took place in an unknown valley, not marked on many maps. When these small stories are told and repeated, so our lives join and connect, when we choose to embrace new learning and use our bigness to heal, not hurt, then we are growing grace and wisdom on the earth. The story is shared by Di Grinnell from Whangare, New Zealand. And this story in the audio form and transcript are available at our website. So you can share this with others. I'm going to end there, and I think we're uh, ready to start our question and answer period. Thank you so much, Mimi. Um, we're now going to begin answering the questions submitted during today's presentation. Um, as a reminder, you can still submit questions to the, ch to the chat box. Um, our first question is, per the trauma-informed model, the person doing harm often has experienced abuse themselves. Then there is a need to ask what happened to you versus blaming the person and working on healing from the trauma. So how does the accountability model also recognize and support healing from trauma for both parties involved? Um, that's a really good question, and I'm going to answer that a couple ways. I, one, I want to say that this is still a really exploratory work um, because this is something that, um, that actually a lot of people in our anti-violence movement have um, really resisted for so long that we're just starting to answer some of these questions. I think people doing... Um, uh, better intervention work or doing work um, with uh, perpetrators of sexual assault um, you know, cer certainly have been asking these questions uh, over a longer period of time. Um, but what I have seen is that uh, many of them have seen that when we delve too much into people's personal story of trauma and harm, that they have interpreted those as distractions from their own accountability. So I think our question is, yes, how do we really see that um, uh, that not only individual but community forms of harm, as we saw in this story, uh, contribute to uh, the per uh, perpetration of violence, um, how do we make room for somebody to actually explore their own histories of trauma and violence? And how do we not let that be a distraction then from people taking accountability? Can we see those things as woven together I think this is a challenge for us today, and I think what I see as promising is some of the work that we started doing through creative interventions, um, but also some of the work I think that we've seen in uh, more what's more conventionally known as restorative justice circles, and some of the work in, um, some of you may be familiar with narrative therapy, where I've really seen uh, a way that uh, not very many practitioners have been working in this area, but the ones that I know of 
have been really addressing history, histories of harm, but also using histories of um, what one what one what one would have wanted for themselves to actually inform what they might be able to do for others. So um, I I think there's I see a lot of promising directions um, in this area. I think that trauma informed uh, you know, sort of this new focus on that has helped, um, and I think that this needs to be uh, we need to move forward with a lot of care. I hope that answers your question well enough for now. Thank you. Um, and then just the, the last question is, can you talk about a little bit about um, the importance of self-care when you're uh, doing this kind of work? Um, yes, it's very, it, it's very important. I have to admit to be one, in, one of the people that uh, has other people remind me of that. And I'm just going to be very honest about that, um, that a lot of us are involved in really intense work. We're passionate about our work. We're excited about our work, and we have to learn how to slow down and be grounded. Um, I have to say that in more recent years, I've really turned towards for myself um, spiritual practice, which I know looks different for different people, but a way to you know this can be very secular as well, but to a look a, a way to look at um, regular kind of everyday practices we can do to remove ourselves, um, to ground ourselves in, um, the, uh, in presence, in gratitude, in positivity, and uh, to use that, then, that energy to actually uh, bring more transformative kind of approaches to our work, which can be really intense when we're working with uh, sometimes very extreme forms of, of violence, trauma, um, substance use, um, histories of oppression, uh, war, and so on, I, it's really hard for us to continue doing this work in a positive way without having some, some sense of self-care. And I have found that not only through individual spirituality, but through um, having a collective uh, group of people that do not necessarily all doing anti-violence work, but doing social justice work that where we come together and try to practice and have dialogue um, in community. So uh, I think my guess is many of you are, are doing that out there and are and maybe many of you are like looking for other fellow people. So uh, I'm hoping that um, you know we could help support that. That's very helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so but those are the only questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, I guess we're going to um, end here. Uh -huh. um, if you have any other questions, um, please contact us at ctac.info at nyu.edu or our presenter whose contact information is up on this slide. Yeah, I uh, encourage you, if you want to, you can contact me, and I can also um, let you know of some of the other resources and also, some of the other webinars that are coming up this summer. It's kind of been a flurry of webinars looking at these topics, which is really great. I'd say this, this is a good summer to kind of check in and, and mm -hmm. learn about some other things that I might present, but some other, that some other people might present as well. Yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll send out links to um, Mimi's other webinars mm -hmm. after. Um, and also on that note, um, some resources. Yeah. Oh, I also want to. Um, um, so I don't know. I, I noticed that uh, Cameron was on is on this call as well. Um, but there's going to be hopefully an initiative happening through Columbia University where I may be coming and doing a workshop. So uh, please contact. Um, let's see. Again, why don't you? Send me an email if you're interested, and I will also send information about that. The dates aren't sent yet, but are not set yet, but um, it's likely going to be late summer or early fall. Okay, great. Um, okay, um, and then um, we have one other webinar um, coming up in our series. Um, it's with Josie Torielli. Um, on best practices. Um, that'll be on June 8th from 12 to 1. 
Uh, and then we also have some other events, among the many other events <laughs> and uh, presentations um, coming up through CTAC. You can visit ctechny.org for more information. Um, thank you so much, Mimi. Mm -hmm. uh, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. Thank As you so a reminder, much for joining. Yes, thank you. Um, as a reminder, the presentation slides and recording will be posted on ctechny.org in one to two business days. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate it if you could complete that and provide your feedback. Uh, on behalf of McSilver, CTEC, and MCTEC, and our presenters, thank you for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day.